Welcome to the next uh, lecture in quantitative methods in chemistry. We are into the sixth week where we have uh, started to understand what is data, what is error, what is the uncertainty associated with them, how to fit data and uh, concepts of that sort. As we are moving forward to this week, we will be trying to learn how to use different software in order to document your data and perform even the analysis within this software. The reason why we would like to do this is because as science has become enormous, one starts to acquire quite an amount of data before uh, they start writing their observations. So uh, rather uh, performing inferences on their observations. So it does help to have all the data put within a given concise format such that it can be easily transported across and at the same time one is able to analyze the data anywhere everywhere at the disposal of a computer. So uh, in order to do the same we will be taking an example like we had done in one of the earlier lectures where we will be taking an example of how a burette can be calibrated and as always we should be also taking a look at the different steps that are required in order to do such an experiment. While doing so we will also be taking a look at where all uh, systematic errors could come up and how this data can be looked upon to see whether you have systematic errors that has propped up in order to for you to repeat the experiments if possible. Uh, so in order to do that the first thing would be to uh, understand the aim where uh, the aim of this experiment is to calibrate the given burette as we all use a burette in many different experiments this I hope uh, will be able to make connect with the students who are listening to this lecture and we will try to analyze what is the accuracy and precision for that given um, burette. As you might remember we define accuracy is the agreement between the sample mean that you have gotten with the true value and precision is how far do these measurements deviate from the sample mean. If you are able to do infinite measurements meaning that if you are able to have a lot of measurements which samples the entire population then you go close to the population mean and the standard deviation will be the standard deviation of the population itself. As always we try to start by asking what are the materials required. As we started by trying to say we are going to be calibrating a buret, we need the buret and in this case we are taking a 50 ml buret and as you might remember all burets have a certain listing at a given temperature. So this is a buret let us say we take it at uh, room temperature where it is listed to have the minimum uh, error that comes up. We would also need a conical flask which we would end up uh, uh, collecting the liquid that we aliquot out of the buret. Uh, conical flask is better than a beaker uh, because even if uh, water starts to uh, splash it does not end up leaving the flask. If in case of a beaker you could have where a droplet goes out that results in systematic error that would come up. So therefore most often for any triterations we end up using conical flasks for this reason. And of course we also would like to stop the conical flask where you would realize uh, if you are making other measurements no contaminations uh, end up coming up in such a flask thermometer as always so as to remember or at least make a note of the temperature at which you are making a measurement. In addition for this experiment this is also going to play a role and one could end up using a mercury thermometer or an ethanol thermometer if you are doing it at room temperature. Uh, ethanol would be safer because in case the thermometer breaks there are no issues. Of course if you are doing experiments at a much higher temperature let us say at 80 degrees Celsius then ethanol thermometer will not work then you might have to use a mercury thermometer. You are able to realize that depending upon the setup that you are going to end up having uh, the apparatus also could slightly change and a judicious choice of the same has to be done while you are about to set up the experiment. Last but not the least one of the important equipment that one might end up needing in this is the analytical balance which would help us determine the amount of aliquots that we end up adding. So now let us foray into the experimental procedure. It is a relatively simple procedure. The first step is to measure room temperature with a thermometer. Uh, this is required because you are going to be having water in your burette and this water is going to be uh, aliquoted out into the conical flask. If you add a known amount of water and if you are able to measure how much you have added this would help you understand how much is the accuracy that comes out of the burette. Remember it just not as the accuracy of the burette it also depends upon how you end up aliquoting. If you start making a few mistakes here let us say you have a certain systematic error that comes up this is going to end up not just as a calibration of burette it is also ending up calibrating your own standards of how much you end up adding. Okay, the next step would be 
to weigh mass of the dry uh, conical flask. This is done because using this flask is where you are going to be adding different volumes of water to measure how much comes out. So this helps you understand if you are aliquoting a certain volume V from the burette and if you are able to measure the same volume uh, by uh, getting the mass and taking a product of the mass with density, you will be able to agree that you are doing whatever you are anticipating to be doing. Okay. Uh, before you start the experiment, rinse the burette with the uh, distilled water that you are using. Remember the emphasis on distilled water is made here, this is to ensure that the density that is measured at a uh, range of temperatures for this water is very well known. If you are using tap water at different locations, it might have different salts which might end up changing the density of water. Uh, therefore, our estimates could be wrong and result in systematic error due to the water that you end up using. So it is always a good idea to be uh, using distal water for this experiment so as to accurately determine the uh, calibration of the burette and the procedure. Uh, remember to fill the burette up to the zero level. This is a mistake many students end up doing where they do not fill up the bottom part of the burette where the solution comes from and this results in a systematic error of about 1 to 2 ml depending upon the make of the burette. Um, yeah, that is the same point that is written here. So generally protocol as you are able to realize will also have the information of do's and do not in order to minimize an influence of the error that might end up coming. Okay. Now starts the experiment. You carefully aliquot 2 ml of the distilled water from the burette to the conical flask. After having done that, close the conical flask and then weigh it again on the weighing balance. Since you weighed the empty conical flask and now you are weighing it with 2 ml addition, you will be able to understand how much of mass of water you have added. Using the density, you will be able to convert uh, the mass into volume and determine how much volume you expected to add and how much volume you ended up adding, therefore helping you how to calibrate the burette. So repeat this task by adding 2 ml of water again and again until you have certain number of measurements so that you can understand whether you are able to repeatedly add carefully or if there are any mistakes that end up coming. Uh, if you might remember the constant error or proportional error could be determined from the experiment that you are doing. We will now take a look at uh, an animation of the same so as to understand what is that we are trying to do. Let us assume that you are trying to make a measurement such that you are going to determine how good the accuracy and precision is. As you might have remembered earlier, we will be taking an example of arrows hitting a dartboard and let us say you want to hit right at the center of the dartboard, how are you going to achieve this? And in order to do this, all the dots, if you might remember, were represented in a 2D uh, surface as you might end up seeing here coming up as dots in the measurement. And the average and the standard deviation which help us understand accuracy would be given as a dot that goes in the center with bars that help you understand what is the standard deviation that end up coming. And let us say these are the four different measurements that we end up having. We had already seen this during the lecture which gives you better accuracy and which gives you better precision. As a scientist, if you are calibrating the burette, you want to ensure that if you are adding 2 ml, you exactly want to add only 2 ml and not more or less. As you are able to realize, these are four different scatters one ends up having uh, just to exemplify the point that we are trying to understand who gives you better precision, who be gives you better accuracy and who neither gives you accuracy or precision. So let us say xi is the observed value meaning that you are trying to make measurements and x is the true value, capital X is the true value meaning that that is where you want to be as close as possible after your measurement and x bar is the mean value which is trying to pick up what is the true value. Then uh, what we end up doing is that these are all the measured or the observed values. You determine what is the mean that comes out of this measurement and take a difference between this mean to that of uh, every observed value so that you are understanding how, how much residuals come into place, meaning that how far is each measurement from the sample mean itself. Having done that, the next part would be to uh, determine how the sample mean and the standard deviation parameter would help you assess accuracy and precision. So you want to ensure that you have a certain number of measurements n that goes through and sigma as a sample standard deviation as given here. In this case, it is a population standard deviation assuming you have good number of measurements and in the case that n is small, this ends up being uh, given as 
the square root of sums of squares between difference between the sample mean and the observed value divided by n minus 1 for n number of measurements where n is a small number. Now having done that, let us try to look at how can we distinguish the dartboards that we saw a little while back. What you end up seeing is that if you want to hit the middle of the dartboard, the average nicely comes up to the middle, the standard deviation is fairly within the first circle. On the other hand, in the second case, what ends up having happening is that although the average comes up nicely at the center, the spread of the points are quite a bit. And you are able to realize some of the points are even falling beyond the 3 standard deviation which does make sense because you are uh, looking at 0.3 percent of the values which might end up falling out. And on the other hand, in this case what you are able to realize while well, the true value is at the center, the average value for all of this which is the sample mean comes up quite far away although you have very good precision that ends up coming up. So this is one of the cases where one has to be careful although you have poor accuracy or very high precision and not always or never in any given scenario this is a good reason because this ends up resulting in a biased analysis. Now going to the next case if you see the true value that is here the average value for these measurements are far away and the spread is bad which results in an imprecise and an inaccurate measurement. This is a very bad scenario to be existing or working in. Okay, so now let us take a quick look at how this experiment will be performed. You are looking at a burette right here where the distilled water that you end up adding is carefully added onto the burette. Ensure that the burette is open so as to fill the bottom portion of it uh, which will ensure that no systematic errors come into place. If you are not filling this part, you are definitely going to introduce a certain constant error across each of your measurement. Now having done that, we are trying to give a schematic where okay, you measure the weight of a stopboard conical flask uh, and once you have gotten that, the next step would be to take the conical flask and carefully add a few uh, ml of water into it and repeat the measurement in the weighing balance. The difference in this would help you understand how much of uh, how much mass of water has been added and then this is where we are coming into this week's topic of how the data can be entered into a software. If you are able to realize a good scientist would end up making a table that is comprehensive as you are able to realize these are the measurements that are being done and these are the different volumes we end up uh, adding. In this case we are trying to say let us say you do 25 experiments where n equal to 22 by adding 2 ml you are expected to finally finish off in 50 ml. So the next step uh, while you are doing this would be measuring the mass of the conical flask with water which means that you should have also had the empty weight of the conical. Remember the density of water is going to play a role because as a function of temperature density also changes. So it is a good idea to have the temperature to start with. Now that uh, once you measure the empty weight after as you keep adding the aliquots you will be able to measure what weight has come through and therefore you can determine what mass is added and what is the actual volume difference that comes up. Having done that you will be able to find the differences for, for each of the aliquot and get the mean. The mean from the distance, uh, the difference of the mean from actually every addition will give you the residual from which we will be calculating the standard deviation. Of course first step would be to get the differences from uh, each of the measurement to the mean as given in the residual, square of the residual, sum of the squares of the residuals, then use the uh, formula for the standard deviation and finally get the sample standard deviation in terms of sigma. So once you get this, you can actually plot as a function of volume that you ended up adding in the burette, what is the actual volume that came up which will help you fit and determine whether your accuracy is good which we will be seeing in a moment and how off are you from each of the measurement that ended up happening. So now let us start to go ahead and pick up some of the uh, uh, skills that you might end up needing uh, for the software analysis. Okay, so now we are moving on to how this experiment can be nicely documented with the use of a software. So uh, here as you are able to see this experiment is done at 300 degree Kelvin so as to uh, get the density of water. If you realize the density of water at 300 Kelvin is 0.996 by which we end up uh, writing here. Many of the software spreadsheet software in particular end up having their own bias on how many decimal points to uh, indicate. So it is always a good idea for you to go and carefully change uh, whatever number of significant figures make sense. And let us assume that uh, for this measurement the scientist measures a total mass of 60.253 grams where the uncertainty exists 
the third uh, uh, the last decimal basically uh, in 1 milligram for each of this measurement and uh, let us say that the following measurements were made oops. let us say that after the scientist has carefully determined the empty weight of the conical he ends up adding 2 ml aliquots each time to perform 12 such experiments here the case n is equal to 12 and he is also able to measure the mass of the conical as a function of this volume that has been added as you are able to realize uh, this comes up with the mass of the conical so the first step that would end up happening here is to take uh, the difference in each of the steps so as to understand how much volume has been added. So it, we have been looking at how spirit sheets could be used for different analysis we are going to be ending up doing the same thing where we carefully add formulae in order to get whatever we want. So in this case you want to understand what is the mass of the 2 ml aliquot addition to that of the uh, mass of the conical itself. So this is going to be uh, in the cell C4 as in most of the spreadsheets you are going to have alphabetical uh, sorting up the top and numerical sorting on the left. So a given cell can be attributed to a certain alphabet and a number in this case you want to take the difference between uh, the mass of the conical which is entered in the cell C4 to that of the mass of the empty conical which is in H1. So what ends up happening here is that you write the formula C4 minus H1. So if you are able to realize the C4 is highlighted with a blue while the H1 is highlighted with a red which helps you understand which two parameters are you taking a difference between in this measurement. Once you hit enter you are able to realize that this has carefully calculated the difference between this value and that uh, of the empty conical flask. Of course one can repeat the same process by typing it where you take the difference between uh, C5 and that of H1 and so on. Although this appears a little automated this is indeed a boring and a laborious process and there are better ways of writing such a formula where you actually say it is C4 minus dollar $H dollar $1 which indicates that if I am copy pasting this set of formula onto this onto these cells what ends up happening is that you will carefully notice is that as you copy paste C4 becomes C5 while the H1 does not change. So this helps you because if you are having many different values one it takes a lot of time for you to uh, take the difference carefully with this otherwise if you copy paste this formula this will be erroneous without the dollar because it will end up taking differences not from this but also from the other cells that go here. Okay. So for instance why do not we take an example of what happens if we do not have the dollar here. Well the first value will come up fine the remaining values will not make sense as you are able to realize it is not able to understand the value here because it is trying to take the difference between 64.2301 to that of the square of the residual so which does not make sense it is a string and as you go for forward you are able to realize that this value is the difference between C7 and H4 which is not the difference that you want to end up taking. So one has to be very careful where you in include this dollar such that for every value you end up measuring the dollar one does not move at all. So this helps you understand how to use spreadsheets in order to make differences across uh, different cells and keeping one cell constant while the other cell incre increments based on the value that you want to measure. So now that you know what is the mass of water that has been aliquoted one has to remember to get the volume because you are adding volume and you would like to see what is the response that comes from a given volume. So the volume uh, is going to be given by the product of mass to its uh, density. Once again in this case I am using another formula that goes as D4 asterisk E1. The asterisk is a symbol for multiplication that we end up using in all these software and uh, division is uh, plainly given by a backslash. So here one is able to realize that D4 star E1 is what you want and similar to the previous example if you copy paste this for all of these cells it is going to end up having a problem because you while you want to increment the D 
you do not want to increment e because it is a single value. So, what you end up doing is to give it as a dollar e dollar 1 in the formula. Now, if you copy paste it would make total sense where carefully the volume that has been added in each of the aliquot nicely comes up. Now, what you are able to realize is that for every 2 ml increment you are able to see the amount of volume that you have added. So, the first step here would be to take the difference between how much you have added to that of how much you expected yourself to add. So, what you end up getting in this row this can be cap, uh, happily copy pasted largely because all these formula end up going as a serial increment. So, we can also copy paste this. So, now what you see is that for 12 different measurements you have been fairly uh, accurate enough where the mistakes happen in most of the cases in the second decimal. If you carefully pay attention for these measurements the mistake happens in the first decimal itself. This helps you understand the fact that there are measurements where one ends up adding a little more or a little less. One way of determining where do you fall is to take the average of these differences that end up coming by having the average formula. So, this is once again where software help where the average is nothing but the ratio of the sum of each of this value to the total number of measurements. In this case you would end up summing all of them in f dividing by the total number which is 12. So, but instead of doing that you end up getting the average in a single shot. You are able to realize the average nicely represents values across meaning that you have some values that deviate by minus 0.19 ml while others that end up deviating with minus 0 0.10. So, the average of all of this including values that go away and in some cases positive deviations to finally come up at an average of minus 0 0.05. So, this once again indicates that you are probably erroneous in the second decimal, but thinking about the 3 standard deviations that come you are probably looking at minus 0.15 also exist in a value which nicely does happen in this data that you are trying to look at. Now that you have gotten the average of all of these measurements the next step that you would like to do is to take the difference between the sample mean and that of each measurement. Once again if you realize you want to keep make sure the sample mean is kept constant. So, you want to make it as dollar f dollar 16 and you start making the differences and what we end up getting is that these are the residuals for each of the measurement that you end up making. So, just before going ahead let us see whether how how good has our aliquots been. So, I am trying to plot the aliquots that you ended up adding in this case the column B with that of column G carefully selecting only the values that we would like to plot. So, if you go to insert and plot a scatter plot what you are able to realize is that in the x axis you have the different values rather the volumes that you only quoted and in the y axis the residual meaning that how far from the average yet that you deviated and you are nicely able to see good amount of points less than the average and more than the average. Of course, in this measurement it is quite a, a interesting to see that the initial first values are less than the average and the final values are above than the average. This could also indicate a bias or a systematic error that comes up, but for now let us not worry about it. Let us uh, go ahead and try to understand uh, what is the standard deviation. In order to do that we would like to take the square of it which is given by that cell caret 2, caret indicates to the power of and 2 indicates as a square. If you want to take the cube you would do caret 3. So, now you end up getting the square of the residuals because if you remember a standard deviation is nothing but the square root of sum of squares of the residuals to the total number of measurement or total number of measurements minus 1. In this case since you have only 12 measurements you have to do uh, square root uh, divided by n minus 1. So, what are we going to get here? Let us try to take the sum, sum of all the residuals. And you can also try to get the average of the residual.
you see in this case the average of the residual nicely falls very close to 0 this indicates that almost every measurement from the uh, from the average measurement that you end up getting you nicely have equal number of points above the average and below the average and the magnitude of this value being small indicates that you don't have large errors that have come up okay now that you have taken a sum you want to uh, get the following measurement which is going to be this value divided by total number of counts that you end up having luckily this kind of software nicely have the kind of count that you end up having meaning that it can itself count how many values you have so in this case the count is going to be obtained by using the formula or the library function called count and selecting the values that you have gotten it and since it is n minus 1 I am taking h17 which is the sum of the residual square divided by the count minus 1. So what you end up getting is this is the variance and the standard deviation is going to be the square root of this variance okay. So now that we have understood this is a representation of the precision of measurement what is my average we should be able to understand what is the average that comes up by having yet another cell that we can define here. The average can on the other hand can also be obtained by a quick fit I hope you have learnt what is fit in the previous classes. So let us try to do a fit of the variable that you ended up changing that is the independent variable to that of the dependent variable that you ended up getting from the measurement and if you do a scatter plot you will nicely get a linear curve and this should be uh, helping us to understand what is the accuracy that comes up let us try to add a trend line trend line helps you get a fit nowadays software help you get all this in a single click and you are able to remember uh, that for these kind of measurements if you added no volume of water you are supposed to get no volume of water so therefore you can set the intercept to 0 meaning that at when you have added no volume of water you expect no mass of water to be dis, uh, obtained. You can also display the equation on the chart to start with let us also see what happens when you do not have the intercept set to 0 and you can also have a reasonable way of determining what is indeed the uh, uh, fit whether the fit is good enough or not basically the linear regression fits help you get a parameter called r square in this case the r square is very close to 1 you might remember r square of 0 means it is a poor fit and r square of 1 means it is an excellent fit and what you are able to see here where x is the variable that you are varying this is the slope that you end up getting this is the intercept that you end up getting the intercept says what is the constant offset that you end up getting well the slope gives you an indication of how much proportionality comes into play let us say that you wanted to add 2 ml every time and you precisely and accurately added only 2 ml this curve is going to be fit with an equation which says y equal to x meaning that for every 2 ml that you added you are able to measure 2 ml correctly but you are able to realize there are deviations that come up largely because there have been differences that have come due to various different things of course due to systematic errors that could come from the weighing or from the aliquots that you ended up doing where you added one drop more or less on the other hand maybe your temperature was fluctuating during these measurements which once again ends up having errors that might increase uh, if the temperature kept, kept on changing fluctuating during these measurements and the standard offset could have come from the basic fact that the burette or the uh, weighing balance was miscalibrated meaning that which is why before starting any experiment calibrating the instrument becomes important and of course the fit makes you happy in this case because the fit seems to be quite reasonable where all the points are in fact contained within the fitted line which is shown as dotted line in this case. So you are able to see that the dotted line nicely passes over each of the fitted value or each of the measured value which indicates that you have gotten a reasonable fit okay. Now uh, having understood that why do not we try to see what is the average value that had come up for each of this measurement. In order to get that what we will end up doing right now is to take the difference between the values that you have obtained. So for the first one you already got 2 ml for the next aliquot of measurements we can try to ask what is the difference between my subsequent measurements and then you copy paste this carefully to understand what you end up getting. So now what you are able to realize is that for every 2 ml that you try to add you are having subtle deviations that come up meaning that in this case you ended up adding 10 microliters more in this case you ended up uh, 
adding 40 micro about 40 microliters less in this case about 50 microliters more and so on here about uh, 100 mic uh, sorry not microliters uh, about uh, uh, 10 uh, yeah about 10 microliters more okay I think and then uh, about 100 microliters more here. So let us try to take the average that comes up here and then the average will help you understand how accurate you were you wanted to add 2 ml and you are actually at 2 ml and you should be able to even get the standard deviation of this measurement let us try to see how different it is from the standard deviation that you have measured. If you are able to see the fitted value gives 0 0.0529 and that is somewhere close to what you are getting here. So you are able to realize the same analysis could be done in subtly different ways which give you subtly different values but overall what you are able to understand here you had a 2 ml that you wanted to aliquot and you are indeed getting the average around 2 but your standard deviation is about 0.0. 06 ml right so basically you have a variation of 60 microliters in each of the aliquot that you ended up getting and you are also able to remember the fact that the residuals that that came for each of the measurements are above and below the average which makes you happy let us take another example in a similar case and in this case I have already done uh, all the necessary uh, math using the similar type of formula that we saw in the previous slide so what you are able to see here the experimentalist ended up measuring all these values again and uh, determine what is the mass per aliquot that ended up coming and converts it to the volume based on the density after having done that finds what is the difference between what aliquot has been added and what was expected to be added and this has been done for each of the step and you are able to realize the uh, average volume difference comes up to minus 0.26 in the previous case you had something very close to 0 which indicated that you had a very reliable basically a precise way of adding aliquots but in this case you are able to realize that is quite far away that indicates that your measurement is, uh, is erroneous and one important thing to remember is that in this case you had quite a number of values that go above and below the uh, average for instance let us plot it again to take a look at it. you are able to realize that good number of values go above and below so that makes you feel good but on the other hand in this case you are already able to observe the fact almost all of these values are negative so why do not we plot and take a look what is happening. When you plot what you are able to realize all the deviations are below the 0 line you want to be as close as to possible to the 0 line and you are able to realize all these points are below the 0 line this clearly indicates that either one measurement completely offset all the other measurements such that although it is randomized around this value it is quite far away that it is randomized around the mean value of minus 0.25 however you are trying to make sure the average goes to 0 so this clearly indicates you are shifted from wherever you are supposed to be. So this clearly indicates a systematic error that has come up in the uh, researchers uh, uh, analysis. Of course repeating the analysis here you end up getting uh, a standard deviation that is very close you got 0.1 earlier you are getting same 0.1 here but slight tries to see what is the accuracy that comes up for this measurement once again that we do by taking a difference between these values. And what you are able to realize here is that the researcher has had an initial measurement which was about 0.15 away and there are some measurements that once again keep on repeating to a similar magnitude. So now let us quickly figure out what is the average. You are able to realize it is coming close to 1.97. eight actually and the standard deviation is about 0.1. Now if you see the similar analysis done for this researcher, this researcher got 2 plus minus 0 2.00 uh, rather 2.01 plus minus 0 0.06 on this case this researcher gets 1.98 plus minus 0.1. So this once again indicates the second researcher has about twice the amount of error uh, or lack of precision that comes in the measurement however the average value works out. Let us quickly take yet another example in this case what ends up happening this has been done wantedly 
where the average is quite far away. In this case, you are able to see a certain number that comes, but in this case, it is much farther away. This probably once again indicates something. Let us uh, quickly take a look at how much far away is this researcher in each of the measurement. you are able to realize that this researcher has the same level of precision as the example 2 which gives uh, point 1. However, the average is clearly shifted away. You are expecting an average of 2 ml, but you are getting something like 2.13 ml. So, in the previous case you got 1.98 plus minus 0 0.10 and in this case you are getting 2.13 plus minus 0 0.10 or 0 0.09. So, although within two standard deviations these two measurements agree with each other, even within one standard deviation they are just barely close to each other, but definitely within two standard deviation they agree with each other, you are able to realize that in comparison to the first researcher who got 2 plus minus 0 0.06, these two people are less accurate and less precise. Accuracy cannot be told for the second guy where the accuracy is still good, but the precision is poor, but in this case you are able to realize that the accuracy is poor, so is the precision. So, you would want to mimic the scenario as the first researcher by making sure your experimental setup is, uh, is uh, done in such a way that no systematic errors prop up. Okay. In this experiment, what we saw so far is how to use a software, in this case a simple spreadsheet in order to make an analysis and try to see whether you do get systematic errors. So, what do we mean by systematic errors when you are trying to measure 2 uh, ml in this case if you keep getting an average that is farther away which is 2.13 there is probably some error that you are consistently making and in this case if you are able to realize when you want to aliquot 2 ml except for this uh, measurement all the other measurements are above the 2 ml. This once again indicates there is a systematic bias that comes into the data on the other hand if you are able to see the first researcher when you wanted to measure 2 ml, you have values that are above and below 2 ml within a small error that comes up an equal number of values above and 2 uh, above and below 2 ml that helps you get a fairly accurate measurement as well. Uh, this is a simple example, but as you start doing bigger experiments, larger number of data sets come up and you would have to do uh, data analysis at every step which ends up also propagating different errors that come up. If you remember we learnt about what is error propagation and those things start also start coming up. In this case where all you could have an error propagation is that the density measurement is assumed that it is correct until the fourth decimal. It could be a case where your thermometer was not uh, good enough to give you within plus minus 1 Kelvin or your density measurement is a little erroneous or you ended up using water that had some contaminants. And at the same time the weighing balance that you end up using need not be calibrated or it has a constant or a proportional error that ends up coming. Therefore, it is always a good idea to calibrate the instruments before you start. And each of the measurement that you end up getting the actual volume is obtained from the density. So, therefore, uh, the error gets propagated from there as well. And finally, what could end up happening is that a uh, researcher as you are copy pasting you might end up making some mistakes which result in erroneous measurements. Luckily, that is personal error, error and that will end up giving a gross mistake from the measurement that you end up making. So, you would be able to pick up what is a gross error and on the other hand systematic errors would come up if you are having all values above or below a certain value that you are trying to measure. Uh, calibration errors have to be taken care before you start and let us say that all of these have been taken care and you still end up getting uh, a standard deviation of about 0 0.06. This indicates these are indeed random errors and the only way for us to find this out is to repeat this measurement several number of times and see how much the standard deviation changes and trying to get a histogram plot. Once you get the histogram if you are able to get a nice normal distribution that kind of indicates that this is indeed a random error and you probably cannot reduce it any further due to uh, uh, whatever inherently exists in the system. So, I hope this has given you an example of how to use software and in this week you would be given data so as to analyze using uh, simple spreadsheet software and to start with this is an example where uh, it is a linear regression that we ended up fitting to understand how the data can be analyzed. And to finish up same way we ended up uh, doing the linear fit for the first one 
you can do it for this one as well just to see how far does the measurement deviate from the average value. You will you might still end up getting good fits here, you still end up getting an R square of 0 0.9999 which indicates it is a good fit, but unlike the first example where you had a value very close to 1, so you had something like uh, 0.9919. In this case, you are having 1.075, which means that it is about 8 percent off, meaning that for each of the measurement you are adding about 8 percent higher or lower. And the standard deviation in this case a negative of minus 0 0.05, which means that it could also have started with slight shift that ends up coming. So one is able to understand that the same analysis could be done in subtly different ways to, uh, to have an idea how far is your measurement and how to be careful when you are making such measurements. In the next class we will be trying to take a look at how to determine enthalpy of dissolution of a solid solute in water and use some similar software to get what is the enthalpy of a dissolution. Thank you very much.